Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today I'd like to give an overview about how to perform and design CRISPR screens. And this is um, um, an overview about what we've published uh, a few years ago, um, the details on how to perform a CRISPR screen in the Nature Protocols paper from 2017. So today I would like to just give you the overall highlights of what's important when designing and performing a CRISPR screen, as well as any updates we've had to the protocol since the publication. Uh, forward genetic screens are very powerful tools for studying um, any genes that lead to a particular phenotype of interest. Traditionally, this was done with uh, Drosophila. And uh, what people traditionally did was they would chemically mutagenize the flies. And then after growing the flies up, picking out which ones had interesting phenotypes that they wanted to focus on. Then they would go back and uh, figure out which genetic perturbations in the fly of interest led to that uh, phenotype. So um, basically, forward genetic screens are uh, very powerful tools for mapping specific genetic perturbations to phenotype. Now, um, the problem with the Drosophila screens is that going back to figuring, figure out uh, which perturbations led to the phenotype of interest was very difficult to do. And with the advent of uh, shRNA and CRISPR-Cas9 screens, this became a lot easier. So to give you a brief overview, shRNA screens work by um, base pair complementary uh, pairing to the mRNA of interest. So what you can do is you can introduce a pool of thousands of shRNA sequences into a, into a pool of cells. Then to figure out which genes uh, led to your phenotype of interest, you would just sequence the shRNA. And you can tell by because shRNA uh, base pair complement the mRNA of interest, which gene was perturbed to get to that phenotype of interest. Now the problem with shRNAs is that even though they did lead to a lot of interesting discoveries, uh, especially in the early days, um, shRNA screens were um, hampered by the fact that shRNAs are often uh, non-specific. So you could get hits where it was uh, producing the phenotype of interest just because the shRNA had a particular off target. With CRISPR, um, what we have is the CRISPR Cas9 knockout as well as activation screens. With CRISPR compared to shRNAs, CRISPR Cas9 had fewer off targets, which means that the screen that you are getting um, had better signal to noise ratio. Uh, just to give a brief overview, again, um, the way Cas9 knockout works is that you can cleave uh, the mammalian genome at a particular designated site um, guided by a sgRNA. And once you cut that site, um, the, there is most likely an NHGJ mediated repair, which means that there, the, um, there's an insertion or a deletion. And from there, you are likely to get a frame shift in your protein sequence. And that leads to depletion of your target uh, mRNA and protein. With Cas9 activation, um, so dead Cas9 um, is basically a catalytically inactive Cas9. Um, what it does is it becomes a programmable DNA binder. Today here I will cover um, dead Cas9 activation, but of course all of the principles that apply to dead Cas9 activation also applies to repression and other epigenetic modifiers for screening. Um, in our lab, the dead Cas9 activator that we worked on is called SAM dead Cas9 activator. What it consists of is three different activation domains that have been uh, built onto the dead Cas9 the BP64, P65, and HSF1 um, activation domains. Together, this forms an activator complex that can very robustly activate um, target genes when you position this dead Cas9 activator at the promoter. And after the positioning, the, this leads to mRNA upregulation. So together, the CRISPR um, Cas9 and dead Cas9 binders have become very useful um, in 
discovering a series of different um, phenotypes of interest. So I will just name a few of these things. Um, more and more every year, there's, there's um, a lot more different phenotypes that people have been interested in screening. But just to list a few examples, um, CRISPR-Cas9 screens have been very useful for drug and toxin resistance, um, discovering gene essentiality. And more recently, people have used them to study um, the viral host factors as well as immunotherapy. Now, going beyond the coding genes, you can also engineer um, CRISPR libraries to target non-coding elements. And that has been of recent interest because now you can study what these non-coding elements do at large scale. And basically, you can do a CRISPR-Cas9 screen for any biological uh, process with a screenable phenotype. So what do I mean by a screenable phenotype? There are three main types of screening selection um, that is possible. So for example, if the, the blue cell here has a perturbation um, that leads to your screening phenotype, then in the positive selection screen, which typically gives you the best signal-to-noise ratio, um, in the positive selection screen, after you apply the selection pressure, you get more of these uh, blue um, perturbations enriched at the end of the screen. And so you can say that your, your target uh, cell is positively enriched. In the negative selection screen, this is the exact opposite, where the blue um, perturbation is no longer found at the end of your screen. Typically, negative selection screens are a bit more difficult to perform and require slightly higher coverage because you are measuring a decrease in signal. And the last one, and perhaps the most versatile one, is the marker gene selection, where you care about one or more genes that lead to your um, particular phenotype. And after you apply the screening pressure, you can apply a series of different methods, um, whether it's by sorting a reporter gene or doing um, single-cell RNA-seq. You can select for your uh, perturbation of interest at the end. The marker gene selection screens typically are, even though they're more versatile, they're a bit more difficult to perform because um, generally the, the, type, the ways that you would go about selecting for this uh, particular um, perturbation of interest are not as scalable as, for example, a positive or a negative selection screen. So that's something to keep in mind. So to give a very broad overview of how the steps that are involved in CRISPR-Cas9 screening. First, you start with um, choosing or designing a library. And then you package this library into lentivirus for delivery in, into your pool of cells of interest. And then you apply a screening selection um, to your pool of cells where you then enrich or deplete the cells with a perturbation of interest. And then at the end of the screen, you isolate the genomic DNA. And based on the guide distribution in this genomic DNA, you can then select candidate genes for validation. So now I will go into detail about each of the steps. So to start out, the library construction part, depending on whether or not you're Picking an existing library or designing your own, this can take anywhere from a few weeks to um, many more weeks. <laughs> so starting with the easy parts, the ready-made libraries on AdGene. So right now, there's a lot of different libraries on AdGene. I will talk about what our lab has put out so far and also mention some of the new ones that I would recommend using. So first, uh, the knockout libraries. It, from our lab, we have the Gecko libraries, which um, many of you probably have heard of. The Gecko libraries come in either a one vector system where the Cas9 and the guide RNA are on the same vector, or a two vector system where you have the Cas9 and uh, guide library separate. Typically, people would choose a two vector system because it's easy to make a cell line with a Cas9 and then just introduce the library at low MOI afterwards, after building the cell line. And the second one that we put out is the activation libraries. The activation library, because the dead Cas9 activator from our lab is, has multiple components, um, this comes in a two-vector or three-vector system. 
Um, in the Gecko library, there are six guide RNAs per gene in the library. And then in the SAM library, there's three guide RNAs targeting the promoter regions of each gene. Now, moving beyond the Gecko and SAM libraries, um, more recently, there's been uh, a number of libraries put out by the GPP, which I would recommend looking at if you don't already have the Gecko library. I think from the knockout, the most recent one might be the Brunello library. Um, and then from activation, I think they have a newer version out as well. So those would be worth looking into if you're just starting out because those libraries have better on-target and off-target scoring systems, more up-to-date on-target and off-target scoring systems. Now, if you're looking at um, a marker gene screen, for example, and you don't want to have to deal with all the genes um, in a genome scale library, what you can do is you can design a targeted library based on an existing library. So in the protocol, we have a script for isolating the um, guide RNAs of interest based on the list of target genes that you want to, want to isolate. And um, so again, typically you would do this if you want to screen at a smaller scale. And I'll talk about the scale of the screen um, afterwards, but um, a screen typically, a genome scale screen will require hundreds of millions of cells. So if you're doing a, a marker gene uh, screen, for example, and you don't want to deal with that many cells, you would want to uh, scale down your library to only genes that you care about. In many instances, this could be genes that are expressed on the cell surface or, or kinases, for example, that you are interested in. And um, so the last one is a de novo library design. We also provide a script in the protocol for designing a de novo library. This could be very useful if, for example, you are designing a, uh, what we call a bashing screen, where um, you are interested in 100 kilobases of genomic DNA, um, non-coding region surrounding a gene of interest, and you want to identify any interesting regulatory elements in that area. Then you probably want to design a custom library um, from scratch because um, there's no existing library that targets the region of interest. So uh, just briefly, the way the library design works is that you have your genome of interest, genomic region of interest, then you uh, look at all the guys that are in that region, and then we will select guys based on minimizing off-target activity and maximizing on-target activity, as well as a few other filter criteria, like GC content and homopolymer searches. These two criteria make the guides easier to synthesize by existing companies. And um, we will also include multiple guides per target to offset um, any potential off-target activity and um, include non-targeting guides as control. So moving on, we then, if you are uh, designing, starting out with a custom library, well, we provide detailed steps on how to scale up the cloning portion. But briefly, you would synthesize the oligo pool uh, using, for example, twist or custom array. And then you would PCR amplify these oligos. Then you would restrict, restriction digest your plasma backbone of interest. And then Gibson in your library into the plasma backbone. Then before you put this into e E, um, e. coli, there's an isopropanol precipitation step to purify the DNA. And um, throughout this cloning step, um, the difference between cloning a library than a, versus a single plasma is that throughout this process, we maintain representation of the screen by scaling up uh, the reactions accordingly. And we have a table for how to scale this up in the paper. So then moving on, before we start the screen, it's very important to do a, a quality control step where we will sequence the library that you've cloned and make sure that all the guys that you think is there should, is actually there. And um, the library is not too skewed. So we do this uh, using next generation sequencing where we will do a PCR to amplify the guides and then we sequence at a depth of 100 reads per guide. And then based on the guide RNA distribution, if you followed, if while you're preparing the library, you uh, followed all the steps that we listed and your oligo manufacturer is very good, then you should uh, have about 70% of your guides should be uh, perfectly matching and with 
lower than 0.5% undetected. And the skew ratio here refers to the top 10% versus the bottom 10% um, of your reads, what that ratio is. So how skewed your library is. So then after NGS verification, then we proceed to package the li library into lentivirus. And the reason why for screens we always do lentiviral, or almost always do lentiviral delivery, is that the lentivirus integrates into the genome of your cells. So if you're doing a positive selection screen or a negative selection screen where you're measuring, trying to measure cell growth or death, then the number of copies of your guide RNA will be representative of how many cells you have from that particular guide. And um, in the protocol, we include both a lepto lipofectamine uh, version and a PEI version. And so you can pick and choose depending on what you want to do. In the protocol, we list uh, lipofectamine 2000, but now we're using lipofectamine 3000. And I've posted this, the details of this particular protocol on our uh, CRISPR Google forum, if anyone is interested. Basically, the difference is that lipofectamine 3000 is much more efficient at less than half the cost. And so it was a no-brainer to switch from 2000 to 3000 for us. And um, if you are interested in non-dividing cells, you can also use AAV for delivery. Okay, then the trans once you have the library, then, then we move into putting this into your pool of cells of interest. Now, before every single screen, it is very important to calculate the lentiviral titer because what you want to make sure is that it is most likely that in every single cell, you only have one copy of the guide RNA. If you start integrating multiple guide RNAs into one cell, then you are confounding your, the effects of that particular guide RNA. So um, in this, before screening, we always do a, a lentiviral titer step. And what this is, is we will either spinfect or mix, depending on your cell type of interest. Spinfection is more efficient than mixing, but at the same time, not all cells can handle uh, being spun for two hours, and so we provide both methods. And what you do is you put different amounts of uh, lentivirus onto your cells, and then um, after selecting for three days using the whatever drug corresponds to your library, then you can calculate the multiplicity of infection, which is a ratio of the cells that have survived your selection versus the cells that did not survive selection. And for the sgRNA library, you want to make sure that you use an MOI of less than 0.3. This ensures that you don't have to start out with a gazillion cells, and you, but at the same time, you try to um, minimize the number of, multiple guide, number of cells that have multiple guide RNAs in your screen. And then from, from here, after calculating the lentiviral titer, you will scale up accordingly using the same exact method that you used to do the titering in the first place. So how, how do you scale the transaction? So as I alluded to previously, a screen is a lot of cells. Um, for the transduction of a screen, per biorep of the screen, if you have 100,000 guide RNAs in your screen and you want a coverage of 500 cells per sgRNA, which we recommend, um, and you have an MOI of 0.3, this means that you need to start with 167 million cells. And during your screen, after the selection, you only need to maintain 100,000 guide RNAs times 500 cells per guide RNA, which is about 50 million cells. So every single time you pass the cells, you need to make sure that you retain 50 million cells to make sure that you maintain the coverage of your screen. So to give you an example, for a knockout screen, what you would do is, if you are using a two-vector system, you would introduce a Cas9 in the, at an MOI of less than 0.7. For Cas9, it's less important that you use an MOI of less than 0.3 because you don't really care if you, one cell has multiple copies of Cas9. And then again, you transduce the guide RNA library at MOI of point, less than 0.3. And then for knockout screens, we typically start the screen seven days from the uh, start of the library transduction because this is where the indels will saturate after seven days. And then during the screen, you can maintain representation at 500 cells per guide RNA. And for screens, it's very important to do multiple bi-reps, just like any experiment. Um, and so you will start out with usually 
two buy reps, I would say, if this is your first time setting up the screen because you're not sure if it's going to work. And then for a very noisy screen, you can increase this up to four buy reps. An activation screen is very similar to a knockout screen where you put in all the components first and then you put in the library. But the difference is that for an activation screen, you can start the screen at as soon as four days after library transaction because these cells have already been selected for the library. And for activation, you don't need to wait for you know, the activations to saturate. It usually is pretty quick. So one of, some of the main considerations during uh, screening selection is that this, this really changes for every screen, how you do this screening selection. But there are a couple of main points that I want to get across because these are things that apply to every single screen, uh, the setup of every single screen. Um, so first, you want to pick parameters that maximize the difference between experimental and control conditions. If you are lucky, there's probably a few genes that serve as good positive and negative controls that you can use to set this, this number, whether it's the drug dose or um, other conditions. For drug dosing, since a lot of people do this, um, typically we will screen at the IC50 of the drug because this is like, there is selection pressure, but it's not so strong that you're killing off most of your cells. And so for drug selections, we typically use IC50. Again, very important, throughout the screen, maintain the coverage of 500 cells per guide RNA. This will reduce the noise in your screen. And if this is your first time setting up the screen and you don't really know at what time you should be harvesting the cells, just collect multiple time points. You can always um, resuspend the cells, freeze them down, throw it in the minus 80, and it's not a lot of work. But if you have these time points, and at the end of your uh, sequencing, if you realize that you need to go back to the other time points, it's very easy to just follow another vial of uh, cell pellet. So it's very important to do this, especially if you don't know what time scale you're going to be looking at. And during screening, it's very important that we keep all the experimental protocols consistent. So if you are um, doing the lentiviral titer one way, do the exact same thing when you're scaling up the screen. Use the same uh, lot of FBS throughout your screen because a screen is already very noisy. So you want to minimize noise as much as possible by keeping your technical procedure uh, very consistent. Okay, so then moving on to harvesting and analyzing the screen. Um, in the protocol, we describe how to use rigor, but at this point, um, rigor is fairly outdated. Most people in our lab actually use magic to analyze our screens, and I would recommend uh, looking into using magic for analyzing your screens. But rigor and magic uh, and any other screening uh, analysis program are very similar in that they, they follow like a similar trajectory. Uh, where you first first normalize the experimental guide counts to control. Um, for positive and negative selection screens, usually for drug dosing, for example, you will have a drug-treated and DMSO-treated control. Um, for flow screens, typically you will have the high bin versus the low bin, um, and the low bin is your control. So you do this normalization to account for any initial starting uh, skew of the library. And then you rank your guides. Um, and then both of these methods will use um, the, so take each gene, look at all the guide rankings for that particular gene, and then calculate um, how enriched each particular gene is relative to um, random chance. And then um, looking at your bioreps, you would take either the average enrichment value or the overlap, depending, and this depends on the person. Either one, both, of, both methods should look very, produce very similar results in this case. So at the end of the screen, it's very, very important that you validate your candidate genes. A screen only produces a rank list of candidate genes. And you have no idea if, well, you, unless all, some of them have been characterized in literature, you really don't know for sure if that particular gene actually produce the phenotype that you are interested in. So uh, for every screen, it's very important to go back and validate guide RNAs. So for validation, the process is extremely similar to uh, doing a normal screen, except now you're replacing the library with a single guide RNA targeting a single gene of interest. So you repeat this entire process. And 
One second. Um, I think it just went blank for some reason. Is it scrolling still? There's some. There is. Well, there should be. Okay, um, but now we're missing the. Yeah, it's just slightly offset. No, I guess we could do this. Okay, so for a knockout screen, this means that at, after you do the put in the guide RNA, you extract the genomic DNA and then you verify that there is indel, and your screening phenotype. Uh, occurs once you put in the individual guide. And because not all indels will deplete the protein, it's also very important that you do a Western blot to verify that your protein of interest is depleted. And in the protocol, we list out a very fast uh, way to do a two-round PCR for evaluating uh, indels. So for the activation screen, what you want to do then is verify that you, activation or repression, you want to verify that your RNA is increased or decreased as you would expect. In the protocol, we provide this home, homebrew uh, protocol for rapid extraction of RNA as well as reverse transcription. It's very similar to the uh, cells to CT protocols uh, by uh, Thermo, except Thermo sells this, proto this uh, kit for I think a couple thousand dollars per plate, and ours costs maybe 1% of that. So I would highly recommend looking into this. Basically, uh, how the way it works is that you make your lysis buffer, you throw the lysis buffer onto your cells, pipe up and down a couple of times, and then you can transfer the cell lysate directly from the plate into a reverse transcription reaction. And then do your reverse transcription, which takes about an hour. Then um, you can directly do TACMAN qPCR on that reverse transcribed reaction. So it's very quick, and if you're doing a lot of um, RT qPCR, this is a very quick way and cheap way to do it. So again, you would want to uh, verify your screening phenotype and also do a Western blot to make sure that your protein was actually overexpressed, as you would expect. So uh, just to highlight again the most important considerations during a screen is like I've repeated several times, um, you want to maintain coverage throughout the screen at five, at least 500 cells per guide RNA in your screen. Now, for noisier screens, or for, for instance, for negative selection screens, you might want to increase this number to 1,000 or 2,000. Um, and it's also very important to include controls. For a screening library, the controls are, for example, the non-targeting guides in the library itself. So you can look at how the non-targeting guides in your library changes before and after selection to figure out how much noise was in your library. And uh, known sgRNAs that, well, sgRNAs that target known genes that should affect your phenotype should be used to select your screening parameters. And you should always include the negative control BIREP in your screen, which is the condition that did not have your screening selection. And again, throughout the screen, remain consistent. Use the same protocols for screening and validation. And I just have my acknowledgement slides, so if anyone has questions, I can take questions now. Yeah, it's doing the same thing. Yeah. Ah, so this is a, actually a very ancient photograph of our lab. Um, most of the people in this picture aren't here anymore, but the people who really helped me set up this protocol taught me all the initial stuff about screening are in this picture. Um, and so I'd like to acknowledge them. Um, for example, Neville, as, as a lot of people know, is also a screening person, and uh, he helped write part of the protocol as well. Thank you. <laughs>